Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Gary Severance with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator for this evening's program. I'm so excited to welcome Dr. David Wong, a leading clinician, influencer, and a renowned lecturer as our speaker tonight for a comprehensive look at socket grafting procedures and techniques. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the box labeled, have a question, and we will answer them live at the end. If it's pertinent to Dr. Wong's content at that time, we may interrupt his presentation. This webinar is eligible for CE. To request CE credit, please click on the CE available icon on your screen and fill out the short survey. Dr. Wong, welcome. Always a pleasure. And I know we have hundreds waiting for your words. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Gary. It's always been a pleasure and honor to work with you the last couple of years. Uh, you always definitely make it interesting and fun. And thank you for hosting today. It's actually a treat for me. So anyway, uh, thank you, everybody, for, for uh, being on the call today. Uh, I've got one hour full of 210 slides of just socket grafting. So hopefully I don't overwhelm you, but if I do, <laughs> you know you know me, we'll be back uh, here in a month or so to, to do more webinars for you. So uh, just go ahead and blow up the, uh, the Q&A box, blow up my, my Instagram, whatever you guys want to do, and we'll get all your questions answered. But today we're going to talk about socket grafting, which is a topic that many of you have probably heard me talk about before, but you know, with, with 200 and some odd thousand dentists around, you know, there, it's, there's always room to learn a little bit more and to capture a different audience. So uh, for those of you all who don't know me, uh, David Wong, I'm a periodontist in Tulsa. And here's my two Instagram accounts. One's kind of my personal, you know, good for questions and stuff like that, david.wong.dds. And the other one's just more for uh, you all who, who like looking at surgery photos and stuff. And that's, as many of you know, is Plaque China. So, um, Hit me up there. I'm pretty good at responding to most questions. So anyway, I thought I would try to make this as, as interactive uh, as possible, as, as interactive as, as a talking head could be anyway. So I thought I'd start off with a little, a little bit of a pretest. So we should probably go the whole hour today. Um, quiz time. What would you do with these sockets? So we're going to do start off with this pretest just to kind of see, not necessarily test your knowledge, but just to test how, how you would handle these types of situations. So if we're looking at tooth number 29 and number 30, they're hopeless teeth. And obviously we're all getting these teeth out. So we're going to extract these teeth. But the questions I have for you to consider would be what graft material would you use in these sockets, if any, and would you use a membrane or not? As far as closing the over the wound, would you obtain primary closure or not? And how long would you wait before placing the implant? So consider that, that scenario. Now we're also going to move forward a little bit and look at this scenario. We have a clinical scenario where, where we have a, a fistulous tract above number seven. But if you look at the radiograph, we have implant, uh, I'm sorry, not implants. We have missing uh, teeth that need to be missing, number seven and number eight. So the teeth have now been extracted. Same four questions, okay? What graft material would you use, if any? Would you use a membrane or not? Do you see yourself getting a primary closure or not? And once again, how long do you wait before placing the implant? So these are the two scenarios uh, that we're going to be playing around with. The idea is we're going to come back through these questions at the end of the hour and see how you all do, okay? So let's go ahead and get started here. So the goals for this presentation... I want to start off, for those of you who don't do any socket grafting at all, just take out teeth. We want, to, we want to talk about the rationale for socket grafting. I want to introduce to you the three different types of sockets and the different techniques that we use to graft those sockets. We're going to talk about the principles of bone grafting, so you know how bone grafts work. Uh, we're going to talk about how to choose a bone graft material, and I'm going to make it simple today since we only have an hour. Uh, we're going to talk about when you need a membrane and when you don't. And then we'll do a little introduction into guided bone regeneration, what that means. So the purpose of today really is to help, you know, share with you a couple of easy techniques that you can take back to your office tomorrow. And then we're going to share with you a couple of situations where, hey, you know what, maybe that's not for me. I should refer to that. So the idea here is to just, you know, try to set the bar for you on what, what's in your comfort zone and maybe what's not. Okay, so 
what we're looking at today, we're going to be hanging out on the left side of your screen today. We're going to be talking about, you know, teeth that have an abundance of tissue, you know, with we're hopeless teeth, maybe a little fistulous tract above it. That's about our limitation today. We're not really going to go into the more complex things where you have no soft tissue to work with, the entire root's exposed, no facial bone. We'll leave that for another day, okay? So let's talk about why we're doing this. So I always lead off with one of my favorite quotes from the former ADA president, Dr. Harry Klinda, who said, there is a great deal of difference between a dentist with 10 years experience and one who has repeated the first year 10 times. So if you're new at socket grafting and never grafted the socket before, this is for you because you're going to do something that you that's very, very rudimentary in, in our field, which is taking out teeth. And we're going to transform that hopefully and add some new, a new skill set or a, a new skill set and a new mindset for you. So what exactly is socket grafting? Socket grafting by definition is the placement of a bone replacement graft in an extraction socket usually at the time of the extraction. So we're doing it immediately after we take the tooth out. So what, first off, what do we know exactly about extractions, socket grafts, and bone loss? So I'm going to share with you just a few different studies here just to nerd out a little bit, share with you why we use evidence-based dentistry uh, to make to support our clinical our practices. So let's start off by talking about the fate of the buckle wall. This is by a good friend, Dr. Myron Nevins. So what they looked at in this study was they separated extracted teeth into you know, sites that were uh, extraction sockets that were grafted and extraction sockets that were not grafted. Okay, and What they determined was that grafted sites had less buccal bone loss. Okay, Pretty easy. So 79% of the grafted sites had less than 20% buccal bone loss. Whereas if you just let, let the socket heal by itself, 71% had more than 20% buccal bone loss. So the bottom line here is that socket grafts minimize buccal bone loss. Now I want to go back just one click here. If you also will notice too that just because you graft the site does not mean you preserve 100% of the bone. Even when you graft the site, you still lose a little bit of bone. That's that's where that 20% comes in. So I don't want you all thinking, hey, I learned the socket grafting technique I should be able to preserve 100% of the bone. That does not typically happen. So study number two, let's look at this one. So this is looking at extraction sites, once again, uh, uh, grafted sites versus not grafted sites, looking at the quality. So the first study I showed you looked at the quantity of the bone. Now we're going to be looking at the quality. And what they discovered in this situation is that when you graft a socket, that socket has a higher percentage of bone and mineralized tissue inside the socket versus or compared to ungrafted sites because the ungrafted sites had a mixture of bone and connective tissue because they weren't grafted. So the bottom line here is that socket grafts improve bone quality. So you get more bone, less connective tissue inside the socket. So overall, if you summarize what we know about sockets, socket grafting, bone loss, we know that when you take out a tooth, within the first two to three years, you lose anywhere from 40 to 60% of your total bone volume. Now, you lose the width a lot more than you do the height, but at any rate, you lose a lot, okay? And we also know that this process continues throughout the patient's life, albeit at a slower rate of only one half percent to one percent every year. But the bottom line here is bone loss is fast after you have a tooth extracted and it continues forever okay, at a slower rate. So let's separate fact from fiction. So one argument that I often get with people you know, who are anti-socket graft is they will, tell, they will say to me, look, I am a great exodontist, right? I can take out these teeth. I don't even know if exodontist is a word, but anyway, they're really good at taking out teeth and and uh, keeping the labial plate intact, as you can see from this cross-section of a CBCT here. So the old school of thought was, is if you can atraumatically, quote-unquote, atraumatically take out a tooth and leave the labial plate intact, then that socket will fill in uh, with bone by itself, and you don't need a socket graft. You know, some docs would go so far as to say anybody who would suggest socket grafting in this situation is, you know, just trying to take the patient's money because they're doing something that's unnecessary, okay? 
But now that we know, having had study after study about this thin piece of labial plate, we now know, thanks to this theory called the bundle bone theory, we now know that that labial plate is actually pretty weak. It's bundled bone, which means that it's very delicate. It doesn't have much of a blood supply. That blood supply is very delicate. So once that tooth is gone, it loses its blood supply, and then therefore it will start to collapse. So that's why even with socket grafting, you lose some of that labial plate. But the biggest thing here is even though you're really good at taking out teeth and you leave that labial plate intact, that bone is, is so thin that it will disappear on you. Okay. So if you look at this same example, here's the labial plate totally intact at the time of the extraction. Here's that same exact site three months later. That labial plate disappears. It does not fill in the bone. So if you can imagine trying to place an implant now into that thin, thin, that thin ridge on the lingual side, virtually uh, impossible without further augmentation. So that's the, that's the scenario we're in uh, right now. Now, what patients need to know, and I like to keep some of these photos around so I can show them because, you know, they're thinking, hey, my tooth is broken or my tooth hurts. Just pull the tooth out. I like to share with them what, what happens if we were to just pull the tooth out without adding some bone graft material in there. So this is an example of what, of what I'll show them. You can see that labial ridge collapse right in the aesthetic zone of this young, young patient here. Um, these are also situations where you know, the, the ridge just collapsed. Some of these may or may not have been atraumatic uh, extractions, but at any rate, you can see that labial plate definitely collapses and can lead to not only an aesthetic deformity, but it can lead to some, you know, some qualitative deformities as well, because you can have perio defects and other bony defects around the adjacent teeth um, as well. So, um, of course, you know, we've all been here before where you, you're, you're taking out a canine and bam, the labial plate either cracks or breaks completely off, and now you're left with this with this big, uh, nasty concavity to deal with. So uh, not only is this a challenge if we're trying to place an implant, but it's, it's, an, it's a cosmetic challenge too. So these are all situations I'm hoping to help you avoid uh, tonight. So socket grafting is predictable. I can tell you this is that case that I, that I just shared with you in our pre-test. You know, we can take out teeth. We, have, we can have blown out labial plates. We can grow beautiful bone. Very, very predictably um, in most situations. But if they're so predictable, why don't more dentists do it or offer it? You know, why, why do I constantly get these referrals, you know, from dentists uh, with, with patients uh, who want new places that have no bone? You know, and, you're, and you ask, you know, time and time again, I would say just about 100% of the time when a patient you know, comes to us uh, for an implant consult, they have no bone. And you ask them, what, you know, did they place a socket graft whenever they had their tooth out? It's the answer is always no. You know, they always just say that they put me in a headlock, put their knee in my chest, yanked the tooth out, and that was it. So I have a few reasons, and this is not scientific by any means, but I would say after teaching socket grafting uh, for the last 13, 14 years, the, there's some common reasons that people give for not wanting to graft sockets. Number one is that there's no perceived need. Um, a lot of times, they, the prevailing thought really is, is is that doesn't the bone fill the socket by itself anyway? And I'll, I'll show them this example. So this is a patient. This is what I see every single day. This patient shows up to our office and says, hey, my, my dentist pulled my tooth about six months ago, and I've I don't want to do a bridge. I want to do an implant. So he referred me to your office. He says, I've got a ton of bone. So you look at this periapical film, right? And you look at the adjacent teeth. The adjacent teeth look really good. You have good interproximal bone heights. You know, there's not any you know, huge dip in the bone. There's a little bit, but not much. But if you look at the sockets, they look well healed. It looks really, really good. If you look at it clinically, you know, the soft tissue is a little bit a little bit, uh, you know, bumpy or uneven, but for the most part, yeah, I would agree that that looks like a ton of bone. You know, matter of fact, to me, I'm like, well, why doesn't your dentist just do the implant? There's a bunch of bone there. But what do we do now that we didn't used to do? We nowadays we always take CBCTs to confirm that that bone looks good because if you look at it clinically, 
you do see a little bit of a collapse on the patient. Okay, not much, but you do see a little bit. But if you look at the CBCT, I'm going to direct you right over that area of number 19. Look at that socket, you know, on the right side, at the very, very top. There, there's no bone in that socket, right? If you look at it even closer, there's no bone. Um, so where, where is the bone? And why does it look so good on a periapical film? Well, obviously, it looks good on a periapical film because we have really thick you know, facial and lingual plates. So when that, so when that X-ray, when that you know, goes, you know, shoots through there, it's picking up the facial and lingual plates. It doesn't pick up what's in the middle because that the ridges are so thick, uh, the plates are so thick. I mean, so when you actually look at this in cross section, we're going to have a heck of a time. You know, at least it's not a slam dunk. You know, trying to put an implant there now. Would this have been an easy socket graft? Absolutely, you bet. We would have had probably a, a dang near 100% success rate on, on, on this type of a socket graft, and anybody could put an implant in, the, in this ridge that's so wide. But now it's a little different because there's no bone in them. Reason number two why people don't socket graft is they don't know what graft to use. And I see this as a big problem because there's so many different companies that have regenerative products out there. It's It's very, very very confusing. I mean, unless you were a periodontal you know, resident or, or an oral surgery resident, you probably wouldn't know what FDBA was or DFDBA or TCP, ABM, EMD, you know. What's going on, right? So it can be very, very, very confusing. So that's what I'm here for, is to try to dumb everything down, not that we're not smart people, but we got to somehow you know, rain all this stuff in because there are literally dozens and dozens of different products that we, we can all use for socket grafting. It does not need to be that, that difficult. So what I want to do today is take the stress off of you and just show you what I use. Reason number three why people don't socket graft is they just don't know how to do it. You know, uh, they'll get on the Instagrams and things like that and they'll look at some of our pictures and like, you know, I saw, you know, all that suturing and all this membrane and all this stuff. That's not something I really want to do, or I don't know how to do that. I'm here to tell you, we're going to show you today um, a couple different techniques that are super easy that don't involve you know, these types of suturing techniques. Um, at the end, I'm going to show you some situations that do, but that way you can you can get a feel for it and learn to diagnose these situations yourselves and come up with a treatment plan that may or may not fit your practice. So you'll be able to figure out uh, what what's... Uh, you know what what's in your comfort zone and what isn't so once again today we're going to talk about the simple stuff on the left hand side of your screen we're going to avoid all the complicated stuff today so the biggest factors in, in growing bone is going to be the type of extraction site that you have I, I would say that is going to influence your success or failure more than anything is did you identify properly identify the type of extraction site that you have so that you can use you know perform the proper technique so what I want to show you here are the keys to predictable socket grafting or any bone graft. It's a very, very simple four-step concept here. It's called the four S's, and I get this from Dr. Stewart from. I did not uh, make any of this stuff up at all. This is all from, from his work. Um, but there's the four S's of bone grafting. The first S is that if you don't have a clean surface, you can't grow bone to it, okay? So if you're trying to, you know, grow bone to a root surface, like a furcation, that root surface has to be squeaky clean. If you're trying to grow the bone in, inside a socket, it's got to be clean. It's got to be a nice, clean socket. So we can't have a lot of granulation tissue or a cyst or a granuloma in there. we got to get all that stuff out. S number two is that that graft, the bone graft, is what we're talking about, has to be stable. If that bone graft is moving around, it's not going to grow bone. Third S is space maintenance. So if your bone is getting squashed, you know, by something like, let's just say a flipper partial or something, you're not going to grow bone in that area. And that, by the way, is going to be something different than what a lot of people, what a, a lot of people learn. So I'll, I'll touch base on that here in a second. Fourth S is proper suturing. Okay. So a lot of times people are under the, they misunderstand when you need primary closure and when you don't. So the proper suturing uh, technique is going to be really, really important to the success of, of your socket graft. We'll talk about that as well. That's why it was in the pretest. 
The other two things you need for successful bone grafting is you need a blood supply and a source of bone growing cells. So that all that means is you're growing bone on surfaces that where bone should be. Okay, so sockets. So the reason why I, I start every new dentist when we're talking about bone grafting, I start everybody with socket grafting because it's the simplest to understand and it's also the most predictable. The reason why socket grafts are so predictable is because primarily as sockets are acute wounds, okay? And I, and I teach this over and over and over. Acute wounds heal way better than chronic wounds. So you'll be more successful at grafting a socket than I would be trying to graft a perio defect or a frication, okay? Between the two of us, you're going to, you're going to be, you're going to outperform me on a socket graft. Number two, sockets often have four wall defects at worst three usually for what for what uh, most restorative dentists are doing uh, reason number three it's a good source of blood vessels which i just talked to you about that we need that the secret weapon though is the pdl cells so sockets are lined by a periodontal ligament which unless we're talking about you know severe severe perio disease most of the time you're gonna have a nice uh, pdl uh, lining the lining the socket that's going to help you grow bone. And matter of fact, the PDL cells is, is the reason why when I did my you know, separating back from fiction bit a while ago, I, this is why the doctors used to say they didn't graft sockets just because they didn't need to because the PDL cells would grow the bone for them. Sockets are also easy to fulfill the four S's of bone grafting, clean surface, space maintenance, stabilization, um, and of course, suture. So let's choose a bone graft. Now, there's a lot of different bone grafts out there, like I just shared with you. They all have different acronyms that you don't need to know anything about. But just suffice to say, if when you're talking to patients about, you know, where's the bone graft coming from, you know, they need to understand that there's four different sources of bone. We can either get bone from you. Uh, using your own bone, which is the gold standard, but it also hurts more and you might have limited quantities, or we can get it, you know, out of a bottle, you know, like this, or, you know, like, gosh, I always keep several of these bottles around just to kind of show patients what this stuff looks like, but we get it out of a bottle and it comes from cadavers. And for you all watching the webinar, you guys need to understand that allografts are cadaver bone and they, they are generally categorized into two different you know, categories. Mineralized or demineralized bone. For today, we're going to use mineralized bone. That's all we're going to use today, mineralized bone. Um, if patients aren't cool with using their own bone or cadaver bone, then another thing to consider would be animal bone or a xenograft. Most common animals that we use are going to be uh, cows or pigs, so bovine or porcine bone. And then lastly, uh, if they're not cool with any of that stuff, we can use synthetic grafts like an alloplast. Alloplast has a lot of different alloplasts. So anything that's synthetic can be called an alloplast. That could include uh, uh, ceramics, bioceramics, uh, bioactive glasses, uh, calcium sulfate, hydroxyapatite, lots of lots and lots of things. Okay? But for the most part, I do my best to socket graft with using mineralized cortical bone or mineralized cortical cancellous bone. At any rate, it's an allograft, so it's an average bone. Um, what I'm high on right now, and this is different if you've seen any of my other previous webinars before, this is actually a little a little change up that we've, that we've done for the last uh, about a year and a half, two years now. We've gone to a Gen 8 blend, which is from BioHorizons. Everybody knows that I, I use quite a few BioHorizons implants. I also use a lot of their bone bone grafts and membranes, so that's where I'm coming from here. Um, the Gen 8 blend is nice because it's a cortical cancellous graft. Uh, if you guys have seen my, my webinars before, I've always preached using mineralized cortical bone. This is something else I, 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 we've been on uh, for the last year and a half or two. This is 70% cortical bone and 30% cancellous. Now, the only reason I don't get any better results using this blend, but I will say this, um, People find that it works. It's more workable. So it's kind of like choosing your favorite composite or impression material or whatever. You know, you might just like the way it works a little bit better. So this is why I'm testing this stuff out. The cortical chips, 
I've always liked cortical bone because the cortical chips are very compactable. It's a very robust, sturdy, you know, uh, uh, sturdy particle. So it, it's really, I can always call it the hard, crunchy stuff. And that's what I wanted. Um, Cancel's chips are kind of nice uh, because they're softer and, and usually smaller particles, but they're also mineralized. But what, what happens with Cancel's bone, a couple schools of thought there is that since it comes from the middle of the, of the long bone, um, it's supposed to have all the nutrients and all the growth factors, which I don't really believe that. But from a workability perspective, it's the softer stuff, the softer spongy stuff. So I think having a 70-30 blend of this stuff is really nice for us to be able to condense in our socket without overpacking it so that you know you can get proper fluid exchange, lots of blood and that and that and, and, uh, that type of thing going into and out of the graft. So that's the deal. Um what patients need to know is that and they're going to ask because they're going to usually not even ask you. They'll ask, you know, your, your office manager. They'll ask your, your clinical assistant. They'll always ask, number one, is, is this stuff safe? Because it sounds weird, you know, taking you know, bone from somebody else and putting it in me. Um, and they also so they worry a lot about disease transmission um, and safety. So I always tell them it's safe. You know, and how I know it's safe is that in the 1980s, you know, during the AIDS and HIV, um, situation back then, you know, they actually did an experiment where they actually spiked this bone, you know, with HIV, and then they ran it through their their uh, process uh, for sterilization and also for processing the freeze-dried portion of bone. Um, and they discovered after they tested it that none of the samples had any HIV. So I know that the processing and sterilization um, uh, process works perfectly you know, for eliminating any uh, chance of disease transmission. They also need to understand, patients also need to understand that if you're going to do a bone graft, do it now. Because once that socket has a chance to heal and then there's and you've already lost that buckle plate, it's really, really hard to get it back. Okay. It costs more to get it back to do a ridge augmentation. It's it's way more invasive. It costs more and it's less predictable. So they need to understand that taking a tooth out and putting a bone graft in at the same time is about the cheapest bone graft that they're ever going to do. It's the most predictable bone graft that they're ever going to do. And it's the least painful bone graft that they'll ever have. They also need to know that just taking it out and leaving it alone, um, it is always an option, of course, but it's I don't like that option as much because it does result in faster and more severe bone loss um, than periodontal disease. So let's talk technique. Um, the basic socket grafting technique for those of you all who care about insurance codes is D7953. But the basic socket graft, how it works is in situations where you have, you take out a tooth and you have four walls of bones. For this, I like teeth that are broken off at the gum line. You know, maybe they have recurrent caries that ate all the way through the crown and they, you know, fit down on something and it broke off. That's perfect. Um, you don't want situations where they have, you know, severe periodontal disease. Those are hard or Gigantic periapical radiolucency, those are hard. So trying to pick teeth that you know are, are being lost to de decay or, or fracture. So armamentarium is very, very simple. All you need is anything that you can get your hands on that's going to take the tooth down easily. On this list, probably the only thing you guys may or may not have is a straight periotome. And those are easy, probably less than 200 bucks, and you can have a straight one and an angled one. And I'll, sh I'll share with you how that works uh, right now. So here we've got tooth number nine that we're going to extract horizontally root fractured, and which is perfect. So you got good bone interproximally, so that's like the perfect situation. So when you have a defect as large as an extraction socket, you need a bone graft with a slower resorption time. So that's why any bone graft you, you have, you're going to want to pick something that's got, you know, uh, mineralized bone in it. So. If you look at this bottle of Mineros, it's cortical cancellous chips. That's the Gen 8 blend that I just showed you. So here we are. We've got tooth number nine. The first thing that I do when I'm taking out a front tooth is I make a sulcular incision all the way around the tooth just to loosen up the gingival fibers. And what you want to do after you do that is, is you're going to want to insert that 15 blade. I use a 15, not a 15C, just because it's got more of a blunted tip instead of so sharp. But I take that 15 blade and I jam that thing into the periodontal ligament on the mesial side and I let it sit there for you know a minute 
And then I take it out and I jam it in the periodontal ligament on the distal side. This is all on the facial. And I let that sit there for about a minute or so. And then I move to the periotome. The periotome is basically just a hair wider or thicker than, than a 15 blade. And we just put it and we work it, you know, back and forth into the PDL space on the mesial and the distal, and now also on the lingual. So you're getting this thing 270 degrees around. You never, ever put an instrument on the facial plate because that facial plate may be either thin or non-existent. So you don't want to chip off any thin bone or tear the tissue. So we're going to do that 270 degrees around. Like I said, that horizontal root fracture, so the crown fell off, which is fine. We're just going to repeat those same steps uh, on the root now. So here's that periotome on the uh, mesial. We're working it across the lingual side now, and then out it pops right out. Okay. So at this point, what you're supposed to do is look at uh, what you're supposed to have is a nice, clean socket, nice, intact papilla. And if you have that, your next step here is going to get your Pro, and you're going to put it into the socket and your job here, this is the important, most important part of diagnosing the socket, is you want to count how many walls of bone you have. You should have a facial, lingual, mesial, and distal uh, plate. Okay. So at that point, you take your Gen 8 blend, and that's this stuff right here. Okay. Take the cap off and you put some sterile water or sterile saline into it. Okay. So you have this little cap, just like you see here. And the mistake that assistants have is they'll just dump water in it and just and say, hey, it's hydrated. Well, these particles are very, very light. So if you just put water or uh, saline on top, that, that liquid will just sit and float on top. So you really need to stir it up. So tell your assistants, uh, your assistants to stir it up really, really good. And let it sit there for at least 15 to 20 minutes. So do this at the beginning of the appointment, okay? Um, don't, don't take the tooth out and then start hydrating. And then you're just wasting time. So at this point, you just grab your favorite instrument. I use a plastic instrument or a number one Woodson. Um, and then I just pack it in there. And then I, I get a, a dry cotton tip applicator and I use it to lightly condense the bone wrap into the side. And then we'll just close with a figure eight suture. And I'll share, I'll show that to you uh, here closer here, here in a second. And then you temporize with one of three things. This is an Essex, Essex retainer. You can use a flipper partial, or you can just bond that tooth right back. Just cut the root off and bond the tooth right back to the adjacent teeth if you want to. I take a radiograph, and because we're dealing with mineralized bone, you'll see that bone wrapped on the radiograph. So you'll see it. Uh, it's radio opaque, but the key thing here is you want to pack the bone, in, you know, even with the surrounding uh, interproximal bone height, not the not the height of the tissue. As far as when you would place your implant, you do that 8 to 12 weeks after your socket graft. I say 12 weeks. So just the answer is going to be 12 weeks after your socket graft before you place your implant. Okay. So let's just say you're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and people don't believe in implants, which there's a lot of, of around here. Let's just say they want to do a bridge instead. That's totally fine. Here's how you're going to, going to develop the pontic with your socket graft. This is a beautiful technique. So here you have tooth number six, hopeless. We're going to have a bridge from five to seven, okay? So we're going to graft the socket, just like I showed you with your um, Gen 8 blend. Now, when you make your temporary bridge, okay, here's your potting design. It's going to be an ovate potting design, not a modified ridge lap or anything like that. It's going to be an ovate potting, and you want it to extend subgingivally three millimeters just like it is here, okay? Got a little chip in it, but let me show you what it looks like when we're done. So by 12 weeks, this is what it looks like, okay? So you're using that ovate ponic design because it, it goes subgingivally three millimeters. It's gonna train the tissue. It's gonna look perfect for, for a bridge. It's gonna, you know, aesthetically, it probably looks as good or better than an implant. It even has the canine eminence there. So that's how you do that. now. Uh, for a bridge, if you're going to make your final impression using that technique, 12 weeks. It's the same 12 week, uh, 12, 12 week rule. So for molars, let's just say, you know, healing, these things heal pretty fast. So I always tell patients, 
allow anywhere from four to eight weeks for the soft tissue to totally heal over a, mo a molar site. So this is kind of the what you can see here, but four and two weeks later. So that figure eight suture, you're not going to, it doesn't take much, right? All you're trying to do is just cinch up the tissue just a little bit. You're going to notice there's no membrane involved because we have four walls of bone. This is that first type of socket. It's the basic socket graft, okay? Um, oh, it's not medication. I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's the same as if you were to take out a tooth and didn't do a socket graft. You're going to give them something for pain, get them on amoxicillin or whatever. You know, if they're allergic to that, use, you know, a Z-Pack or Keflex or whatever you guys are using. And then I just put them on any type of an antimicrobial rinse. It doesn't have to be for hex. So the question I commonly get after this is, when do I use a membrane? So let's just say, you know, you have this tooth, tooth number 10. It's obviously hopeless and it's got lots of caries. So we're going to take the tooth out here and we're going to grab the socket. Now, the question the, where people get nervous is that looks like particles, right? It's like these little particles. So people get nervous, like, don't I need to put a membrane in there, you know, to keep it from falling out? And the answer is no. Okay. But I, for me, I know I've been doing this for over 20 years. I don't use membranes. If I have four walls of bone and we're dealing with a type one basic socket graft, I don't, but some people do. If you want to use a membrane, go ahead, but I will propose to you some, an alternative because membranes cost, you know, 65 to 80 bucks each. You may not want to spend that money just because you feel like this bone graft is going to come out. What you're going to use instead is just a little collagen strip. Now, you don't have to use this one from BioHorizon. I do just because I like to order everything from one place. It's called a BioStrip, but it's also the same thing as Colotape or Helotape, same stuff. So all I do is I'll, I'll grab a little piece of this. I'll make a little circle and put it, put a little patch right over my graft. And then I'll get my 4-0 chromic gut suture and tie a figure eight suture over the top, and we're done. Okay, then you put your flipper, Essex retainer, bond the tooth back, whatever you want it to do. Okay. But if you didn't use this, what holds the bone graft in place anyway is a blood clot. Okay, because you're grafting all the way up to the level of the adjacent bone. You're gonna get a blood clot between the tissue and and your graft material, and that's what actually holds the graft in, okay? But if you get nervous, do it this way. This will cost you an extra you know, few dollars is all. So there's four situations where this basic socket grafting technique will not work. And uh, situation number one is where there's a blown out plate, okay? So we're going to eventually get to this type of scenario. Situation number two is if you have severe periodontal disease. There's no bone to preserve. That's why called socket grafting or a ridge preservation graft. So when you have situations like this, there's just no bone to preserve. So socket grafting does not work in this situation. Situation number three is if you look in there clinically and you have a periapical you know, abscess uh, radiographically or if you see a, a fistulous tract clinically, it's not a basic socket graft anymore. So what I just showed you won't work. And then situation number four is if you have access to a CBCT, if you were to actually take a cross-section of some of these teeth, like this canine or lower incisors, what you're going to notice is that, is that the teeth are wider buccal lingually than the bone that they sit in. So you can, you can preserve that socket all you want to or graft the socket all you want to. You're still going to come back in three months later with no bone because it's, it was too thin to begin with. So these are uh, situations where it's nice to have a CBCT. That way you can tell the patient that you can take the tooth out, you can grab the socket, but you're going to have to have a ridge augmentation at some point later if you want to do an implant. So important points about the basic socket grafting technique is that this socket has four walls of bone. The facial plate is completely intact. A membrane is not needed and primary closure is not needed. Okay, so keep those in mind. Four walls of bone, you have an intact facial plate, you don't need a membrane, don't need primary closure. And as far as when to place your implant, you're going to do that in 12 weeks. Okay. Now, common questions is, does it matter when you hydrate the bone in before you graft? I use sterile saline or sterile water. Either one of the two is fine. Okay. What about cancellous versus cortico versus cortico cancellous bone? I kind of answered why we use what, but for all intents and purposes, all, any of these three will work. I tend to use more cortical or cortical cancellous bone. 
just because I like the big crunchy pebbles and I can I can really condense it into the socket. What about using mineralized, mineralized versus demineralized bone? I'm going to use mineralized bone because it lasts long. It lasts longer into that bigger defect, and it's radiopaque, so I can see it. Uh, without a membrane, what keeps the graph material inside the socket? Like I talked about, uh, you can use a membrane if you want to, but I don't. What keeps the, the graph material inside is the incorporation of a blood clot. So, what about fenestrations and dehiscences? So. I've only got about 20 minutes left, so we're going to fly a little bit, and we're going to keep doing more and more of these for you. So don't don't you worry. Dealing with small fenestrations. So what were the first few time, times I showed you this, we've had intact facial plates. Now we're going to have small fenestrations, about five millimeters in diameter or less in the facial in the facial plate. So what you're looking for here clinically is you'll see a small little fistula tract, right? Just like you see here, right between seven and eight. So how do you get from there? And then you have a fenestration in the facial plate. How do you get from there, here, to here, right? Where now the tissue is down and you have a more aesthetically acceptable result. So how do we get there? On, on top of that, if you're new at surgery, maybe you don't want to reflect uh, these two, you know, you don't want to drop two vertical incisions in the aesthetic zone. That might make you a little nervous. I know it did for me at first. So I've got something super easy for you. It's going to be called the ice cream cone technique, and we're going to introduce you to you uh, the concept of, of how to use these uh, barrier membranes. Okay, so for this, I use Memlock. It's a rigid, four to six month la uh, long lasting, uh, college resorbable collagen membrane. So it goes away on its own. You don't have to take it out. It's rigid, which is perfect for this ice cream cone technique that I'm going to show you. On top of that, when you compare it to some of the other um, Membranes out there that a lot of times when we're talking about membranes, we talk about suture pullout strength, and all that means is that it's not going to tear. Up. So you can you can play with it, you can you can condense it, you can do all sorts of stuff, and it's not going to disappear. Up. I mean, it's not going to tear or disappear. Up. So let's talk about the ice cream cone technique uh, from Dr. Dennis Tarnow. It's another way to treat fenestration. So. If you look at this case right here, it's tooth number eight. And he, this uh, young lady's got internal root resorption that has now become external because it's been going on a while. You can tell that they started to do the root canal, but failed on it and referred it to our office. So when you take out the tooth, you'll notice that you've got this little granuloma, granulomatous tissue extending out of the tooth and through the facial plate. So instead of reflecting a big a big flap, what you're going to do, remember, the first step after you take out a tooth is use your perio probe and count the walls. So if you count and, and you can feel a perforation in the facial plate and you estimate it to be about five millimeters or less, all you do is you trim what we call an ice cream cone membrane out of this sheet of memoir. And sometimes I'll make it look like a, an ice cream cone, sometimes I don't. But at any rate, you put the cone part of this rigid membrane into the socket. And you're going to basically patch that fenestration or hole on the labial plate, okay? So from the occlusal view, it's gonna look something like that. And then you're going to just graft the site with your Gen 8 blend, your cortical cancellous bone, and then you're gonna fold the ice cream portion over to cover the rest of the socket. Now you're going to wanna to cover this at this point. And then you'll just tie your figure eight sutures, once again, with chromic gut sutures. Three months later, so you're still at 12 weeks, so three months later, you're going to have lots of bone to put your implant in. And that's how this ice cream cone technique works. This is our uh, implant placement and, then of course, the provisional and then the final crown. So this is a great way to, to preserve the, the soft tissue. If you like the soft tissues, it's a great way to preserve the hard and soft tissue so that you can put your implant in an ideal position and subsequently it makes it a snap you know, to restore the, the restore the implant. So common questions here is why is a membrane needed? So generally speaking, anytime you are missing any bone on the facial or lingual plate, you got to use a membrane. You have to, because if you don't, soft tissue will blow through that fenestration and invade your socket and you'll start and you'll end up getting you know soft tissue uh, or connective tissue in that socket instead of instead of bone. So that's why. Uh, will any membrane suffice? 
I recommend rigid resorbable membrane. So it's got to be rigid and it's definitely got to be resorbable. That's, that's not even a question. It's got to be resorbable, but I, I like rigid membranes because I like to, once again, you know, I'm kind of heavy handed sometimes. I like to be able to pack things without tearing. So if you look at another scenario situation, same thing. Okay. Same exact thing, except it's tooth number nine. So we're going to take out this tooth. You'll feel up there with your probe. Facial plate, there's a little fenestration. I'm going to, this time, I'm, I, I must have had extra chair time, so I went ahead and made it look like an ice cream cone, kind of. So you're going to put the cone in, into the socket, pack your bone, fold it over, and tie in your figure eight suture. Come back in um, three months later. Remember, it's still 12 weeks. And then you'll be ready to place your implant and, and make the crown uh, after after uh, four months after healing. So that's how the ice cream cone technique works. Um, to share with that to share with share that with you one more time. Um, if you guys are into implants, I always like to share with you what our easy slam dunk implant cases for the aesthetic zone. It's this one. Okay, you want to pick a tooth that's short and square shaped. Okay, that's perfect. You know, you want to avoid long tapered teeth because those have a really high, uh, high potential for black triangle formation, whereas these don't. So short, square teeth, and you also, it's nice if you're the tooth you're replacing is already a little bit shorter than the adjacent tooth, like number eight is here. So the tooth is coming out, ice cream cone membrane goes in, wrap the socket, fold it over, tie in your figure eight suture with your full row chromic gut, and then you'll come back in later with your implant, and then of course your um, final crown. So these are all nice slam dunk, easy cases uh, for you all to consider, okay? Now, what's not easy, here's what's not easy, and we'll do this for the next 10 minutes. The third type of socket, which is the hardest, Okay, that's the blown out facial plate. Now, this is where it gets a little crazy. You got to start, you know, getting primary closure. Uh, you got to use membranes, a lot of them. You have to learn how to suture them a little bit better. Um, the healing time's a lot longer. So it's a little bit trickier with blown out facial plates. I'm going to share with you a couple of cases here. So here uh, we have a young lady who's congenitally missing number seven and number 10. But the problem here is while we were doing her implant exam, I noticed that she's got a fistula above number eight, fistulous tract. And we take a, a PA of it, you can see that big radial lucency above number eight. And then we take a CBCT and there's a blown out facial plate. I send her to endo, endo says, take the tooth out. So I'm like, oh man, that's kind of a bummer on a, on a you know, 19, 20 year old kid. But we ended up doing that. So the complexity with these type three sockets where you have a blown out facial plate, is that this fenestration is way bigger than five millimeters. The facial plate's mostly gone. So here we have to do a lot more soft tissue consideration. So here we did a papilla sparing uh, flap where we're not including the papilla in the flap design. We're putting our bone graft into the socket, but because it's a type three socket with missing, missing facial plate, we got to put the bone graft on the outside of the socket as well. And then we got to cover it with a membrane and then get primary closure. Okay, so there's a couple things here. The membrane is, is the same, okay? Rigid, resorbable membrane. But here we're getting primary closure and we can't just use chroma gut anymore. We're using vitro. We're, we're using something a little bit more robust that we got to come back in and take out two weeks later. So what this does for us, though, is if we do it right, we'll get all this bone back uh, for this young lady. And this is the CBCT cross-section. You can see we've got a ton of bone. And then... Uh, there's the before and after, but clinically, if you look at this, I mean, we got just a massive amount of bone here. So here we're going to place our implant for number eight and number 10. Uh, you guys are probably thinking, why didn't you do an implant for number seven too? Um, I talk about this in more detail in some of our other webinars, but I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, we did it for aesthetic purposes and here's why. If you put two, if you look at uh, class six there at the very bottom of your screen, the average papilla height between two implants is only three and a half millimeters tall. Whereas if you go implant next to a pontic, it, the average uh, papilla height is five and a half millimeter, millimeters tall. So you get an extra two millimeters by doing implant pontic. And that's why we did that. So um, there we are. The papilla height's nice and preserved for this young lady. And that is 
a type three socket. So if we go into that in a little bit more detail, this is the before and after, but let's talk about another case here. And I'm going to end with this one. If you look at this scenario, this guy's got a large periagal radial lucency around the failing endo number 10. And you can see it's, you know, that, that lesion's kind of getting a little scary towards the central and the canine too. But if you look at the CBCT, he's got bone loss that goes through and through from facial all the way through the lingual plate. No facial plate, no lingual plate. Um, this is what it looks like in, in our software, and this is what it looks like clinically. So we got a massive amount of bone loss on the facial as well as the lingual. Um, you'll notice in the aesthetic zone, I, when I can, and of course, we have different lectures on different flap designs, but we, when we can, we try to uh, minimize uh, or eliminate including the papilla in our flat design. So our bone graft material is going to go into the socket and on the outside wall or outside plate as well. This membrane is trimmed too, too wide. So we're going to redo that and make sure that that membrane's wound edges are right on the inside of our flap. That way we can suture it without any of the membrane sticking out. Then we're going to get primary closure. So the key thing here with a type three socket, once again, is you have you know no facial or lingual plate. Uh, you have to get primary closure over all this. Uh, otherwise, it's really really difficult to grow bone. And also, you got to use non-resorbable sutures pretty much. So this is what it looks like at two weeks. Beautiful results so far. Everything's nice and big and fat. It's maintained its volume. So we're going to come back in. Not in three months, but six months, we're going to take a CBCT. Okay. Now you're going to notice here on the on the buccal side, lots of bone, right? And then if, for those of you guys paying attention, on the lingual side, what happens? It's concave. Okay. The reason it's concave is why? Well, it's because I forgot to place a membrane on the lingual side. I just got too caught up, you know, going into pictures and all this stuff. I forgot to place a membrane on the lingual side. So what ended up happening here is that. We got that soft tissue invagination to that socket, and we got the soft tissue there instead of bone. So it kind of shows you just kind of a nice, beautiful mistake here that I can show you the consequences of not using a membrane when one is indicated. At any rate, we got pretty lucky here. It's six months later, we got lots of bone here at our surgical reentry. So a ton of bone for a lateral incisor, able to place the implant and, and replace that too. So now is the time, I think our time is pretty good here, is our, we did our pre-test, now we'll do our post-test here. So what would you do showing these same pictures again, same radiographs, number 29 and number 30 are missing. So let's see what we've learned in the last 50 minutes or so. So you have a, you have two sockets. You have facial wall, lingual wall, mesial, and distal walls all intact. What graft material would you use? Okay. I would say mineralized cortical bone or cortical cancellous bone is what we've been talking about. So that's the answer there. As far as do you have to use a membrane or not? If you're thinking you don't need a membrane, you can use one if you want to. But if you're thinking you don't need one, you are correct. If you are also thinking that you do not need primary closure. You are also correct in that. And if you said 12 weeks before placing the implant, that's the right answer. Okay, so let's let's play through this. Here's your socket uh, graphs with your mineral mineralized cortical bone. There's no membrane, as you can see here. So there's no membrane from here to here. And then we're going to get uh, not primary closure or non-primary closure with our uh, non resorbable sutures here. This is silk. You can use whatever you want. We just happen to use silk here. But the whole point of it is, is there's no membrane and no primary closure. You're going to come back in in 12 weeks and voila, there's lots of bone there. Okay. So let's do the other one. So here we have that fistulous tract above number seven. This is what the radiographic presentation looks like. Teeth are coming out. Now, in this situation, there's there's uh, full blown out facial plates. So what graft material would you use? Um, once again, you're going to use mineralized cortical bone or mineralized cortical cancellous bone. If anybody asks you why, you say you want big, robust uh, particles. 
uh, that's going to last a long time in that big defect. That's why you use uh, what we use. Now, do you need a membrane or not? You absolutely need a membrane. It's going to be very imperative to the success of this procedure. As far as primary closure or not, um, you got to have primary closure in something like this. Okay? Um, I know there are people who post cases where they don't, but I'm here to tell you, if you want predictable results, you got to get primary closure over this. As far as how long before placing the implant, it's not 12 weeks. It's going to be it's going to be uh, lean towards six months. Okay. So let's play through that. So we've already grafted, already did our membrane. Big thing here is primary closure. Okay, so we've got primary closure on the facial and the occlusal. Everything's nice and neat. And we're going to come back in here six months later and there's your bone on the facial aspect and the occlusal. You can see how big and robust um, that's that uh, the socket graphs, technically a ridge augmentation, uh, has become. So. There you are with your um, osteotomies prepared for your implants. You can see how much facial bone we have. It's really, really nice. And if you want, I know I blasted through a lot of this, but if you want to learn more, um, uh, this is a, a Henry Schein uh, BioHorizon uh, sponsored course that we're doing live. Uh, me and Dr. Curry love it in uh, February of next year. It's going to be in Las Vegas. Uh, Nineteen hundred ninety-five bucks. It's really nice. Uh, you get all the lecture stuff. By the way, you guys have only got a snippet today. Uh, we end up with about fifteen hundred different slides, and then you get to see, see live surgery. We draw blood from me to do the PRF, and then um, you'll see live surgery and also pig doll labs and suturing labs too. So good stuff. If you guys want to join up, it's uh, uh, seating's limited to thirty people. And with that, um, uh, we had a ten percent off code through. A couple of days ago, but I don't think it works anymore. So I think it's just uh, 1995. Anyway, if you guys want to keep in touch or want more information about courses or have questions about your own cases, feel free to reach out. But that, my friends, is, is my time. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Um, and yeah, great information, obviously, because a lot of questions have come in. I do want to respect nice. everybody's time. Um, so we'll go through the questions, but I do want to make sure everybody knows they can click the CE button above and fill out the questions. And also that we did record this, so you'll have a chance to slow it down and go through everything and see all this great information. Um, you'll have to slow down for sure. <laughs> uh, and probably, yeah, you can stop sharing and then everybody will get to see us, uh, which is most important. Let's go through a couple of questions, and they're pretty interesting. We had a couple people, and maybe uh, due to time, keep your answers uh, concise in this case, because we have about 10. A couple of people asked about osteogen plugs by a couple of different companies. What are your thoughts of using osteogen? Yeah, the different plugs, yeah, the plugs are, the plugs are fine in your type 1 sockets. They're fine. Uh, once you start getting into fenestrations and dehiscences, I don't like them as much because they do... Uh, usually with the plugs, they have to fill it with something. Usually it's like a, you know, spongy, like cellulose type, type material. So you, you want to make sure you check that out. Um, also with some of the plugs too, they don't use uh, mineralized cortical or cortical cancellous bone. They use like a xenograft. So you got to be careful with those too. So I would say if you guys have any questions on that, just send me a, uh, Instagram me a sample or something and, I, and I'll tell you what I think of it. But generally speaking, reserve those for your type one sockets. Right. Any published histology on Gen 8 blend, I think, from BioHorizons? Uh, you know, there's not not on Gen 8 partic in particular. I believe if you, obviously, if you check on the BioHorizons website, that they'll have it. Um, there's, they, they have all their uh, their citations. But it's just a cortical cancellous blend, and there's lots of histology on that going all the way back. Um, of course, everything's proprietary, so, you know, just be aware of where, where the studies are. They won't tell you it's Gen 8 blend. If you look at a study, it'll just tell you that it's cortical cancellous bone. So uh, if you look at cortical versus cancellous versus cortical cancellous, for, for basic soffy graphs like what we're talking about tonight, they all perform about the same uh, histologically. You, you won't get but, you know, 35% uh, bone growth at the 12-week mark, which is which is pretty pretty good, you know, for, for your um, implants and stuff. Great. Okay. 
Uh, why is hydration of graft necessary? What are the consequences if not hydrated properly? It's just all about workability. It's really dusty and powdery. So you really want it, uh, you want it hydrated so you can actually, it's kind of, it's not putty like or anything like that, but it just keeps it from, you know, just, a, just the, uh, gosh, the surface tension of the water keeps the particles together uh, versus just powder everywhere. I think you ended with always use a membrane, but if somebody said without a membrane, how do you prevent soft tissue ingrowth? You can't, you can't because, <laughs> you know, soft tissue, you know, that's, that's the thing about, you know, our longer versions of this course is that we talk about the bone race, you know, the bone race between bone versus fibroblast versus epithelial cells. Um, and what we, what we know when we look at, you know, all the studies on cellular motility, Gingival cells are faster than anything. Epithelial cells are faster than bone cells, fibroblasts, and every, everything else. So they will, without a membrane, a barrier to block them, they go right through that penetration or to essence and blast right through your graft. A couple of questions on will PRF, I'm, I think you, I saw it in your course title, uh, will PRF membranes work? Uh, I mean, there's newer studies now that have longer lasting PRF membranes, but I'd say for the general population, they're not using them. PRF membranes are not barrier membranes. So the answer to your question is no. And I know that uh, by personal experience because they call it PRF membranes. So when they first came out on the market uh, 13 years ago, I bought the machine and, and thought that I was going to you know, save all this money by using PRF membranes instead of barrier membranes. They don't exclude the epithelium, so they disappear. <laughs> they disappear fast. But but be on the lookout for newer studies. They have longer lasting ones now, but I don't have that. And I figure if I don't have it, most people don't either. Okay. Which types of membranes can be left exposed if I can't approximate the tissues all the way? Yeah, most of them can be expo left exposed. Anything that's resorbable can be left exposed. The things that you don't want to leave exposed are anything that's got titanium in it. Um, so that, that's pretty much it. There are some uh, Gore-Tex membranes or you know, EPTFE uh, membranes that can be left exposed. Those are non-resorbable. I don't like those as much for me personally as, as, as the way I teach. I like resorbable membranes, and they can be left exposed. It's just that the bone growth underneath is no guarantee. Right. We haven't lost any audience members, but I do want, if you have to leave, Dr. Wong, do you have another five, 10 minutes? I got all the time you guys need. I'm glad right. we haven't lost anybody. That's actually pretty good. Yeah, it is. So uh, if you have to go, we understand CE available. Also, it's a recording. Uh, question. I feel like it's very difficult to just degranulate it fully. How do you verify that it's fully degranulated? And how do you make sure you break the buckle yeah. plate? Yeah, so when we talk about 4S as a bone grafting and having a clean surface, we're not talking about, you know, a dental hygiene uh, definition of that. You know, we're not talking about scaling and root plane the, the walls or anything like that. You know, it just has to be any gross, you know, gigantic granulomas or gran granulomas tissue. That's good enough. Okay, so you, you got to get those big gross uh, 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 pieces out. But if you have a little tag here and there, not a big deal. But if you really are anal retentive about it, you can use a, a diamond burr and, and just kind of brush up against the walls uh, with a diamond burr, and, that, and that'll do it as well. But just be careful, okay. especially on a uh, maxillary molar. Don't go perforating stuff and telling, and telling people I told you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> How do you trim the membranes to fit perfectly? Do you use a template? Nope. I eyeball it, and I use a, uh, I eyeball it, I use a pair of uh, scissors. So I use iris scissors, I-I-R-I-S. I just use a pair of iris scissors, and then I just I just I cut it by hand. Yeah. But yeah, I use a aerial probe to kind of measure, measure it out. A couple of questions. To view the recording, all of you that have registered will get an email in the next week or so that will give you a link to it. And then if you for CE credit, if you click the button above that says CE available, uh, that'll direct you with the questions. If you have any issues afterwards, just email us at webinars at henryshine.com and we'll make sure you have information. Would you ever place bone graft, resorbable membrane, and then non-resorbable 
typical membrane on a facial dehiscence? No, you don't want to do that. Um, so that, that's a great question, though, because everybody's school of thought is the, the purpose of a barrier membrane is to exclude epithelium, right? So why wouldn't you want to? So if one membrane's good, two membranes should be better, right? It, it, by that logic, you know, seven membranes would be even better than that. But that's not how it works. That's not how bone grows. You have to have proper fluid exchange, okay, between the, between your graft your graft site and the recipient bed. Okay, you, you have to you have to have a good fluid exchange. Fluid exchange mean, meaning um, blood, right? So blood can't get through. It's it's nice that you're excluding epithelium, but if you block the blood too, that's another way to not get bone. So do one membrane. If you if there's if you end up with two and they overlap in a couple spots, it's no big deal. But you don't want to use uh, two and, and totally block everything out. That's not that's not good either. So just use one. All right. Do you mix autogenous chip bones with xenograft? Uh, don't use xenograft in these types of sockets because the resorption rate's too long. Okay, but I do like to use autogenous chips whenever I can if it's readily available, like in the the adjacent areas. But I don't like xenografts that much uh, for these for the for this type of presentation. Great. Uh, and then we'll end with a question on patient acceptance. Uh, as far as patient acceptance goes, I find the bone graft is okay, but when people see membrane and bone graft, they get sticker shock. How do you present this? Yeah, so the way I do it, I just all I do is I have one fee for extraction and socket graft that may or that includes the membrane or whatever. So I just do one fee. I don't like to to itemize out everything because then it leads to too many questions after I've already you know, taking the time to explain what we're trying to do, which is minimize bone loss, and prepare them for an implant. So if I, if I go, yeah, if, if we start, if I, it goes back to the classic, if you talk too much, it's, it's not good. So I just, I start off telling them about, you know, the consequences of what happens if you take out a tooth and do nothing. And then usually by, they'll shake their head about the bone graft and all that stuff. But I do my bone graft and membrane is way. That way it's just, it's just one, one thing. Um, I've discovered whenever you start having too many items, they start trying to, you know, you know, mix and match and pick and choose and cherry pick the plan. And it doesn't work out very well for me. So I just say extraction. And I don't even say soccer. I say extraction, bone graft. And that's, that's it. One thing. Great. Uh, they slipped a, m a couple more in knowing you can stay. Any thoughts on autogenous and membranes? Uh, autogenous and membranes are fine. Yeah, that's totally fine. We do we do them all the time. Just not for soggy graphs. Not for soggy graphs. Just to, you know, we try to we try to make things as atraumatic as possible as well. So, yeah, autogenous right. uh, using autogenous bone for a socket that can kind of hurt. So. Which one is your favorite suture technique to retain the membrane for big facial plate resorption bases? Uh, to retain the membrane, the, my favorite is going to be the periosteal anchoring sutures. So that's going back, uh, you know, uh, some people call them rib roast. Some people call them the lasso technique. So if you Google rib roast or lasso technique or periosteal anchoring sutures, that's what, that, those are my favorite. Great. Uh, and Crystal had the last question. Uh, well, not yet. <laughs> Do you hydrate the membrane? I think you already answered that and discussed that a little bit. When to use you the membrane? Yeah. yeah, you actually don't hydrate this membrane. If you're using okay. Memlock, like I, you, you don't you don't hydrate the membrane. You hydrate the bone graft, but not the membrane. Perfect. When to use membrane versus titanium mesh? Uh, you know, since we're talking about socket grafting today, you don't need a titanium mesh. All you need is is just a resorbable uh, rigid membrane. Great, and I think. Uh, Dr. Wong, you gave us all the information we needed to get a hold of you. Uh, you're a fun um, Instagram to follow. Yeah. Both of them are very good to follow. Beautiful family and beautiful work in dentistry. So I appreciate all the time. It's so wonderful to work with you. I know you'll be in Vegas in February, probably doing the surgery, and uh, maybe we should get you when you're back there in May to place the implants then at that time too. So um, we'll see you in Vegas a couple times next year. hope everybody can attend. Dr. Wong, thank you very much for always giving an incredible education. 
and thank all of you for watching. Uh, and again, you will get a notification of the recording as well as take advantage of the CE that's available by clicking the icon above. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful night and thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Hey, thanks everybody. We'll see you again soon.